Welcome to VOHM's V Video Log Podcast, whatever you want to call this thing. Vlogcast. Uh, the Vlogcast. Um, just a really awesome to be able to come to you guys this way. Hope you all are enjoying this. Um, you know, just to kind of go down a road uh, and talk about some you know hot topics that most people feel you know maybe not not comfortable talking about in regular um, settings, but. Today, um, before we get into wokeism part three, I um, want to point you to our website. If you haven't been to our website, it's www.vohmintl.org. Um, there you can find uh, our podcasts. You can find um, uh, you know, the, our calendar list of places that we're going to be. And then uh, there's also a shop. You want to pick up a mug or a t-shirt um, or a hat, whatever, just to kind of... Um, Help us in missions. Uh, really looking forward to um, what the Lord is going to do in the rest of 2022, Dalton. Or sorry, the rest of 2021. We're not in 2022 yet. Um, really looking forward to getting back into Kenya. And um, uh, hopefully Myanmar opens back up so we can go see our orphanages. And uh, just really, really excited about hitting it as hard as we can. But this is also um, opportunities for us to you know, present the gospel to you in this form, in this fashion. We've been talking about um, wokeism. Uh, for those of you that are just joining in, that have not been a part of the past two podcasts, this is part three in wokeism. Dalton, what is wokeism? In the woke church, it's um, you know just the movement of kind of replacing traditional church values with more uh, left-leaning, socially justice-oriented values. And it actually kind of makes us sound like the bad guys when you put it that way. Uh, there's nothing just about social justice. <laughs> no, um, there's not. That's and, right. Uh, there's no value to left-leaning values. Mm. <laughs> so mm. it's more, more should I say it's the embracing of secularism in, in replacement right. of traditional church values. And this has been a long time coming because the church itself has uh, slowly been adapting, you know, this left-leaning philosophy for the last 20 years, really, since the turn of the century. And uh, you, you begin to think about. Now, how great the church has changed, but here we are, and we're dealing with something today that 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, the church never ever thought that we'd have to deal with. Um, but uh, today we're going to be talking about heteronormativity, mm -hmm. and that means a, um, I'm going to let Dalton define that one. So Google, if you just Google heteronormativity def or definition, I don't know what comes up for definition, I just typed in def, uh, what... Google will tell you heteronormativity is, okay? So I, did, I didn't go searching to find the definition I like best. First thing that came up, denoting or relating to a worldview that promotes heterosexuality is the normal or preferred sexual orientation. So what is normal is the hetero, yes, yeah. a man and a woman yes. in sexuality. Now we're going to get into some, some deep stuff here because we are dealing with a culture uh, within the church that is promoting... Uh, a homosexual lifestyle as biblical you know it's a biblical model um, or they get it from the Word of God that it is okay from the Pauline letters that it's okay for you know um, men and women or men you know to have relationships with men and women with women um, and it's uh, you know it's 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 amazing how much Dalton we can twist the Word of God mm. you know either there's a standard or there's not yeah you know and we've been arguing uh, well, for the last 40 years, really, kind of people are looking back and forth on, uh, you know, well, what does the Word of God really say about this? And what, yeah. There's some hot topics, but now we come to a point in history, it's 2021, and there's a movement within the church um, that is embracing this side of uh, life that says God is okay with you living and participating, embracing uh, a homosexual lifestyle. And at, at the very beginning of all this, you know, we, I want to make sure that you all know that um, we view this sin as we view every other sin. And uh, there's grace and forgiveness and there's no condemnation that comes from uh, Dalton or I or the ministry in this regard because it's a real struggle. People in this generation are struggling with it just like they struggle with drugs. And, um, you know, for us to say that it is, um, uh, you know, we just throw you away just because of that, it, it, that's ridiculous. You know, the, 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 the grace of the gospel is uh, enough to, to rip you out of that and place you in, a, in right standing with God. Oh, yeah, so, for sure. You know, so my first thought 
um, the reason we're doing this podcast on heteronormativity is the woke church is defined, its identity is found in its objection to three issues, you know, racism, patriarchy, and heteronormativity. And uh, so my first thought really was, man, this is blasphemous, you know, to, to kind of found the ideology of your church and being opposed to the model that God instituted. Think about that, you know, it's, I mean, Adam um, and Eve, you know, right from the very beginning. The thing about heterosexuality and heteronormativity is that heteronormativity says that heterosexuality is the dominant worldview. Well, that's that's supposed to be that way. Right. It's like hetero, heterosexuality is or is supposed to be the dominant orientation. Like that's supposed to be. It's a design thing, you know. It's yeah, a, yeah. And, and from the know, beginning, I'm sure if if anyone is same sex attracted is listening, they're like, well, it's probably easy for you to say because you're uh, you know not same sex attracted, and that's right. Um, but you know, like Stephen said, ju just as much as we have to address things that the Bible says is wrong, um, th there is obviously a right way to deal with things. But you know, if we were only allowed to deal with and um, make judgments about things that we were attracted to, then you would have to have uh, people who either were drug addicts or former drug addicts as, as people that dealt with all drug-related issues. Right. And the only people that can make laws around murder. Are, are people that pre, had murder, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> and uh, so the the idea that the only people that are qualified to make decisions on or statements, statements. should I say, on these things, right. are people that deal with it. I, I understand the appeal, and um, homosexuality. To kind of segue into the next point, homosexuality is on a different playing field than all of the other things, because if you look at all of the other sexual sins, um, well, not all of them, but let's look at adultery. Okay, if one practices adultery. It requires him to be married. And the moment that he decides to do that, his wife is, is going to be subjected to immense pain. Okay, Absolutely. Same thing, if the wife decides to commit adultery on the husband, the husband is then subjected to immense pain. If you look at pedophilia, uh, the uncalculable damage that is done to the child. If, if you look at rape, the uncalculable damage that's done to the victim. You know, all of, the, all of these other vices, alcoholism, it always affects those that are around you. Um, violence, it definitely affects those that are around you. Anger. Uh, you look at all of these things, and then here's homosexuality all by itself, and not harming anybody. Mm. You know, so yeah. all of these other sins. It's like homosexuality obviously needs to be examined a little bit differently because it, it simply is good, one individual um, just trying to do what makes him happy, not at the expense of other people. Right. So you know, automatically, I, I think that there has to be um, at least a little bit more grace uh, attributed to the way that we deal with this sure. because nobody's wronging anyone else. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And and this idea, you know. Fox News and, and the conservative media are, you know, when Obama made uh, gay marriage legal, they've tried to put the spin on things that uh, surrounding um, pride events is just this overwhelming sense of pedophilia and that, you know, it, it's just all of these uh, homosexuals are just a bunch of pedophiles. It's propaganda, man. Right. Like, I, I've met numerous um, very, very flamboyantly homosexual individuals and I wouldn't consider any of them to be pedophiles. Yeah, right. So I think that the, the wrong approach definitely is to say that, you know, homosexuals are, are all equal to all of the other violent sins. Wow. And then when you get past that to then turn around and say, yeah, but they're pedophiles. Like, right. Come on, right. man. Right. You know, imagine if it was your loved one. Yeah. So. And that's, uh, you know, a, a great friend of mine told me that um, most people have no mercy, none. On, on people that are you know convicted of violent crime or any other crime unless until it, it is their children and then when it, their children are going through it then they're pleading for mercy and they're pleading for grace you know and so here you know in this this conversation it, 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 until it touches your own home you know you just throw them all off the cliff but let's let's be realistic here you know regardless of what vice um, men fall into and women fall into, the value of the human soul is still there. God doesn't write people off just because of, you know, my God, you know, uh, how far, how, I, I just think about even, um, you know, my own life, just, just the stuff that goes on in life. God doesn't just write you off. Um, there's still value and grace and mercy reaches out to you. Now, to kind of begin this, as Dalton has so beautifully put, um, what I want us to kind of look at, a lot of, you know, it is widely accepted that, you know, the Word of God is God's Word. Uh, but Dalton, I think that, you know, it's important for us to just kind of get a picture here of, 
of how this word came to us. We know, we stand, we build our whole life, ministry, uh, my marriage, my the way I op we operate, uh, our family uh, in the home, everything is built on, on the word of God. So, but like to really look at this, I want you to just think about this. Think about God and everything that you're looking at, you know, outside the windows of this office, you know, I, I see, you know, mountains and trees and rivers and, you know, creation. And the God that created everything, this God that created everything, spoke everything into existence, chose, Dalton, he chose to speak to us. He chose to literally verbalize what he desired out of us. And in that, he gave us the Old Testament. And, you know, in the Old Testament, they spoke Hebrew. And then down through history, uh, you look at the moment that Christ was born. It's a tale that's been told around the world. Christ was born. God chose to give us his son. And in giving his son, the Bible says in John, that word became flesh. That word, logo said, God spoke, became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And so Christ lived. And as Christ lived, he is the literal embodiment of the words of God. And so everything that Christ said, he wrote, was written down. It was written down in Aramaic and then translated into Greek. And so here we, we have the English Bible. And this is kind of where we have this this push and pull of, well, what does the Bible really say this? Uh, what is the Bible really saying? And we have this push and pull of translation of, you know, the uh, essential literal and the dynamic, dynamic equivalent. But, you know, this Bible that I hold in my hands is a translation. It's, a, it's translated into English from Greek and Aramaic and Hebrew. And so in order for us to really get to the crux of heteronormativity, how does God view homosexuality? Is it something that has been lost in translation as the woke church is saying, well, this is really just a misinterpretation of scripture? So what they actually say is, um, just for the sake of information, um, they, the word homosexual was first put into the Bible in like the 1920s by a publishing company. So the word homosexual itself um, is not something that you find Paul writing, but the our definition of homosexual fits, it's the same definition as some other words Paul had. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So um, yeah. that's why they have that argument. And so in their argument that the specific word homosexual Though the phrase same-sex attracted might have been used, because the specific word homosexual was not used, they use that as their segue to uh, basically throw out the whole thing. Mm. So, but. That's great. Um, and that, that's kind of the reason why I, I, you know, I, I really wanted us to understand, you know, th th we're going to go back to the original, mm -hmm. because it's important for us to get to the original basis of what, what has been said. So, um, uh, you know, we, we, we look at this whole... Um, issue that our culture is dealing with right now of, you know, and it's, it's funny because secular, within the secular communities, you know, people do as they wish, but it's funny, though, to, to carry it over into the church and make it, you know, a, I guess, a right passage, because there's been some movements um, uh, today that just recently uh, on the um, uh, Pentecost Sunday, there was a church um, that, you know, totally embraced um, transgenderism, you know, and set a transgendered pastor up as their spokesperson. And it's just, it's just so counter. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's Pride Month right now, which we didn't do this on purpose. It just we didn't. It just fell happened. in that way. So we did this three-part series in Pride Month, which... I guess it's a good time to deal with things. I don't know. Uh, it, it almost might come off as we're, we're disrespecting the, the homosexual the community, but that wasn't the intention at all. Yeah. No, it just the way it we all. just got to look at it. If God has spoken, <coughs> what has He said? If right. He, if He's, if He, if God has a mind around this, then what does I, I want to know? If if the, if He has a view around that surrounds this, what is the right view? Because it's easy to take words out of context and out of meaning and so and make it whatever you want. The first thing is why would homosexuality even be bad? Like why would Paul care enough? Why would God care uh, about homosexuality? Mm. Um, this goes back to that point of, you know, it's not something that um, hurts anyone else, so why? And, uh, you know, 
the answer that is low-hanging fruit, the obvious answer, is, well, God, the model that God instituted in Genesis was one man and one woman. Mm -hmm. But more than that, all right, let's go to Romans. We're back. We had a brief interruption, but um, we, we were talking about why God would care about, uh, you know, homosexuality being wrong, and I was actually just about to flip to uh, Romans 1, 24 through 27. Let's read that. Okay. Romans chapter 1, tw yeah. verses 24 through 27. Yes, and so, Therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts to impurity, the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Mm, that's Amen. a key verse right there. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations with those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women who were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. So, without even talking about what is said in, in 1 Corinthians, very obvious that he's clearly talking about homosexuality. Yeah, right here. For 100%. sure. percent Without question. And um, why would it be bad? What, what, what is it about these passions that makes them dishonorable? Right? Like, wh why is it when you interchange the... Uh, male and a female, and you switch out the female for another male, mm. why is it that the same act then suddenly becomes dishonorable and, and um, you know, something that is a sin, basically? So, allow me to read you something. This is interesting, so just stay, stay with us. So, this is a commentary that a pastor that I know wrote, and this is him speaking on this chapter, and he said, why does Paul focus particularly here on homosexuality? It is not that he has some irrational hatred for homosexuals. It is rather that the act of sexual intercourse with a person of the same sex is a stark picture of humanity's rejection of God, turning one's passions and one's worships away from the other and placing them on someone who looks like oneself. Mm. At its core, Paul says that homosexuality is the bitter fruit and outworking of a human race bent on worshiping itself rather than God. We live in that generation. So, the reason why... The homosexual act is, act is is viewed as something that God can't approve is because it is the nonverbal statement, and I think oftentimes the unintentional statement that is made, and mm -hmm. that is that you are taking the biblical model of marriage and what God says. Okay, we so just come we back just, again. Yeah, we just had to pause uh, a second time. A second time because our camera has decided that it wants to act up which is very strange um, it's it's got battery and it's uh, it's not overheated yeah it's really, uh, it's, really it's mounted on a tripod very interesting but I, uh, I think <laughs> oftentimes whenever I, I begin to you know deal with something that is you know heavy hitting but in the right context uh, of where people might be changed or people might you know come to a, a different view of what God expects and you know come to that point of of you know accepting Christ, this stuff starts happening. So, <laughs> Stephen Stephen told me when whenever I first went on a crusade with him, and it actually was the only crusade that this didn't happen. But he said every time he preached this powerful message, uh, powerful. He said every time I preach this message, the power always goes out magically. <laughs> I've always come to the pinnacle of this one message where I know people will get born again, and the uh, power just shuts off. So, regardless, we're going to so, keep moving. Back to, I know exactly where we left off. Yeah. So, it was this commentary about why homosexuality is an inherently dishonorable act at using the biblical verbiage. Right. See, because most homosexuals don't approach it um, with the intent of, uh, you know, trying to blaspheme God. Right? No, it's just no, pursuit right. of my own passion. Right. So, I think there has to be some explanation from the church on behalf of why it's actually bad. Because otherwise, all you're saying is... Um, that your attraction is different from mine and I'm better than you, right? right? Right. So back to what the commentary said. The act of placing one's affections, and now the, uh, the basis of this affection and this attraction is a model that was instituted by God in Genesis. Mm. What homosexuality is, is, is doing is it's taking the attraction that God meant to be placed in his parameters of an ordained marriage, and it's placing it on someone that looks like you. So the man, rather than following God's model of, of marriage and what God says the man is supposed to be attracted to, takes that passion and pours it out on someone that looks like him. Like him. It, it, it's the perfect encapsulation it is. of pride. It, it's the perfect example yeah. of, of literally what made Lucifer fall. It's 
this nonverbal statement that I will reject the God ordained model of male and female and right. instead pour out my passions on something that looks, looks like just me. like me. It is the pursuit of self through indulgence of another. Mm. And and so it's it's the, what it stands for. Right. 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 And it's because of the fact that I believe Paul completely understood the heart of um, the, the homosexuals that he was writing to that it was esteemed as equally as all of the other sins. Because, right. Because if it was done out of intentional blasphemy, I don't think Paul would esteem it as equal. I think it would be esteemed as you know being oh. extra bad, oh, like, yeah. like Jesus treated the Pharisees. Right. And so I think we actually can kind of get a sense that Paul was very cultured because rather than trying to write off the homosexuals as blasphemous because of uh, zealousness, um, he actually just esteems them as he does everyone else. Right. And, and so it, I just think purely this takes a little bit of a more articulate resolve because it's just that sensitive. Mm. But I think clearly here that commentary so exquisitely states why it is in fact. And it, it's it's the same thing, you know, this this is I like I like what you said Dalton is that nonverbal action that is making a statement and um, throughout um, uh, the history of mankind we we have this constant war of you know dethroning God and you might say that Stephen, that's ridiculous. It's actually what we do whenever we deny Christ. It is, you know, I want to rule the throne of my own heart. Oh, yeah. I want to be in control. I want to be in charge. Yes. I do not want anybody else to tell me what to do or how to live. And realistically, as we surrender to Christ, Christ has to, he has to sit on the throne of our hearts. And so, you know, that this is kind of like the ultimate, you know, pursuit of worship of what I look like you know it's that oh, yeah. it's that taking the image of myself and worshiping it and um, you know it's it's pride and pride itself man you can you can go all the way through but from from that element of pride stems all sin because all sin you know is derived right from that one one thing so I found an article yesterday and I'm writing this up and basically what it was is this 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 guy named uh, I think his name was Aaron Giles. He wrote this paper. I was... So we just resolved the camera issue yet again. We've switched to another camera. Uh, I just... We, we could edit all this out, but I think we'll leave some of this in on the podcast so. side just so that y'all can kind of get a yeah. feel for this. Yeah. But, um, Interesting. Anyways. So I found this article. Yeah. Talk to us about this article. It was amazing. And it was written as a response to a man named Dr. Cadwallader. Okay, Cadwallader is what you would consider to be uh, part of the woke movement, and he wrote a paper basically saying that um, there are five main scriptures that Christians use to address um, homosexuality, and that those five scriptures uh, were, were flawed in the way that they were used. Mm -hmm. And so this article goes into such great detail of just deconstructing word by word everything that Paul says, and I was so blown away. I've, I've put a chunk of it in here. So this is Paul. Um, Stephen, would you mind? Uh, we're, we're now currently filming with my phone. Sure. So could you please read 1 Corinthians 7 through 9? Yep, absolutely. So, you know, this is, and this is, again, you know, 1 Corinthians 7, 9. 7 and 9. Um, you know, the reason why we are going to such lengths is to get a real clear understanding of, um, you know, what God is after here. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to get into some original words and uh, give those, you know, by definition of what they actually mean. Mm -hmm. um, First Corinthians 7. So 7 and 9, it says, um, But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. So he's talking about verses 8, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it's good for them if they abide, even as I, because Paul was single. Yeah. But if you cannot contain... Yes. So this is the second half of the scripture that we're about to read. I wanted to read this first so that it could prove to you that what we're saying is in the context of what Paul was saying. So he just he's talking here about passions mm -hmm. and sexual passions sexual and passions. the restraint of those passions for the sake of godliness. Now, right. Stephen, could you could you read 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 through 10? I can. It says verses 9 through 10 uh, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Question mark. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, or abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, covetous, or drunkards, or revilers, or extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. So, 
in the ESV and in the Holman Christian Standard, this, I believe, is the first time that the word homosexual appears. Okay. It's the first time we see the word homosexual. Abusers of themselves of mankind. Yes. Right. And the argument that, well, you know, Paul didn't, that, that word homosexual was in, invented by the publishing company. No. Uh, abusers, read that phrase again. It says in the King James, abusers of themselves with mankind or their own kind. It's much easier to replace that phrase with the word homosexual. And mm -hmm. that's how that word got there. Mm -hmm. It's the meaning is literally the same, right? And, and so I'm going to read you now this paragraph. And, and so the reason that we read 1 Corinthians 7 first is because, for one, the author makes mention of it here, even though the whole article is actually about 1 Corinthians 6. But it goes to show you that in sequence, Paul addresses the sexual sins. And then in chapter 7, he also addresses... Um, those that are same-sex attracted, or not same-sex attracted, those that are heterosexual, right. wanting to do ministry, but yet are being burnt up with passion. Right. So he addresses underneath this umbrella all things that are considered sexual sin. That's why uh, homosexuality is no worse than anything else. It's addressed here just like everything else is. Right. That's right. And Paul actually three times goes um, and makes a list of vices and virtues. And every time there is sexual sin listed in the vice every list. Every single time. Every single every. time. Yep. And so let me to read this paragraph. It is true that neither Paul nor any other biblical writer ever explicitly speaks of what today is called sexual orientation. But Paul says much on human desire, mm. and that we, we just we proved that by first reading 1 Corinthians 7. In the next chapter of 1 Corinthians, he is referring to 1 Corinthians 7 now because this paper is about 1 Corinthians 6. In the next chapter of 1 Corinthians, he says, It is better for the unmarried to be aflame, for the unmarried to marry than be aflame with passion. Mm -hmm. So suggest that Paul accepted that men and women could be driven by desire for each other. Without question. And never imagined that men could be driven by sexual desire for other men and women for women in a world where homosexuality was common is very hard to believe. So to, to put that in perspective, you know, I've said this before, but, you know, we think that we're the only generation that is deal, kind of dealing with this coming to the forefront. We're not. No. The, the, this, this world that Paul was writing to the Corinthian church was full of, homosexuality. you know, yes, full of homosexuality. And so Paul here was addressing desire. And underneath that umbrella of desire, he covered same-sex attraction. Mm. And so what this author is saying is that it, it's, it's such a stretch. It's actually really impossible to say that Paul, being so cultured and so educated, submersed in a culture that was full of homosexuality, would write about passion and never once consider the thought right. that, that men could desire men and women desire women. Right. So to resume this paragraph. Following his general condemnation of pornonia, which por pornonia is the word which means all sexual uh, interactions outside of marriage. So following his general condemnation of pornia, um, all sex outside of marriage, Paul then mentions the idolaters and the adulterers. And the Greek word for that is moixoi, M-O-I-X-O-I. -I. The last word refers specifically to married people who have sexual intercourse with someone of the opposite sex beside their spouse. Pay attention here now. So, so when, adulterers. Paul, when Paul addresses adulterers, moixoi, he's addressing specifically people who are married that have sexual relations with outside. someone of the opposite gender outside of marriage. So a right. man having relations with, with a woman, woman who is not his wife. Not his wife. Very specific. You know, one thing I love about the Greek language is that they have a lot of... Oh, um, man. They have so many words that offer greater specificity in context than right. what we have. That's right. So Paul uses this word talking about adulterers. Now, he then speaks of malakoi and arsenok etai. I, I guess that's uh, A-R-S-E-N-O-K-O-I-T-A-I. Yeah. yeah. And um, the, sometimes the Greek pronunciations are a little different. Arsenokoitai. Maybe. So the exact meaning of these two rare words is much debated, but it is generally agreed that he is condemning sex of one kind or another between men. So same sex. The first term, malakoi, literally means soft, and thus it was often used to address effeminate men. Mm. So most modern commentators and translators conclude that Paul is using it of those who were customarily the passive partner in a homosexual union. So Paul takes the homosexual union and splits it in half. And in the first part of this, he's addressing the effeminate the men. The effeminate men. And so, the soft men. The soft men. Mm -hmm. The second term, arsenokitai, mm -hmm. is a compound of the Greek word male and bed, which can literally be translated male betters. Okay? Koitai, bed, was a common word to speak of sex. So it's male betters and the bed having a connotation to a, to a, mm -hmm. a, a sexual phrase. Right. These two words are used in the prohibitions of homosexual practice in both Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20 and 3. So here we are proving, you know, a lot of, a lot of times the argument from the woke church or, you know, people of this generation is, well, you can't, you know, we're no, no longer under law, we're under grace, you know, the gospel. Which is gospel true. Of grace That's is absolutely true. So we cannot, you know, prove in this context, you know, we can't take Old Testament scripture and try to apply it 
in this generation because if, if we did that then we'd have to live by all the dietary laws of Leviticus and you can't you wear know, mixed linens yeah there's, so there's yeah. a lot of things in in the Old Testament you know that, that that but Christ came to fulfill the whole law yes but in saying that Paul is not removing no he's not you know giving a free pass of homosexuality it's, it's actually ingenious that Paul would use the same word used in Leviticus in the New Testament because then that validates completely yeah. what our understanding of a it carry is. Carryover, yeah, right? right. And so, had it been some new word, it would be, it would leave too much room to try to speculate as to what Paul meant. But because he carries over right. what Leviticus says into the New Testament, you know beyond the shadow of a doubt what it means. So these two words are used in the prohibitions of homosexual practice in both Leviticus eighteen twenty two and Leviticus twenty and three. So Doctor uh, Cadwalder's claim that the etymology of this word. And by what he means by that is that the deriving of its meaning on the basis of its parts. That tells us nothing of how Paul understood it. Um, that argument is completely unconvincing, is what he's saying here. So Cadwalder says that the epistemology of the word um, gives, us no this, yeah. Yeah, gives us no indication as to what Paul thought it meant. And that's completely that's insane. ridiculous. I a, mean, <laughs> a, an example of what we're talking about here, and it wasn't until the 19th century that the word homosexual came to mean. And the word homos in Greek means same. So it's same sexual put together. Mm -hmm. the, the etymology of the word is, is literally where the meaning comes from. So right. to say that Paul had no meaning or no understanding of what the word meant based off its etymology is, is completely, um, basically inadmissible. Right. So given the context of the use of arsenokotai in this instance, namely sexual sins and its background in the two Levitical texts, this is the meaning most likely. Thus, the overwhelming majority of scholars and translators are agreed that the words speak of men having sex with other men. And in context to that, what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 9, it excludes those that do that from the kingdom of God. Is that yes, right? that's the whole purpose. And so Paul, you know, th this, is, this is actually probably the single most important thing is that when you're looking at this list in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he's not talking about, I read this yesterday in a commentary, he's not talking about people that have done these things one time. He's talking about people yeah. that make a habitual, habitual lifestyle, lifestyle out of this thing are removed from the kingdom of God, and meaning that homosexuality and that lifestyle would remove you from being able to be a Christian. And it's, it's really interesting here to note as well that he didn't separate the concept of homosexuality and isolate it and say if you're homosexual you're not going to be able to make it in the kingdom mm -hmm. of heaven he, he lumps it in that you know verses 9 of chapter 6 1 Corinthians know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God be not deceived fornicators uh, idolaters oh my god we live in a full we live in an age full of idolatry you know we can go down the line here the idolatry that's found in religion just in the amount of time that women put into their hair and that guys put into their suits you know, and, and yeah. the, the, the in the fitness world, you know, like there's there's the plenty, of, world. plenty of uh, heterosexual people that are very religious that are consumed with idolatry. Uh, it, it just talks about you know so many the, the effeminate or abusers of themselves, thieves. He lumps homosexuality in here with yeah. thieves, the covetous. We live in a generation that is so covetous. We live in a materialistic society. You know, the covetous, nor the drunkards, and we go on, and the revilers, extortioners, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, in essence, you know, what we're talking about here is, you know, it, it is the sin of homosexuality, uh, you know, based on your sexuality, is in context with a lot of other sins that Paul names. It's mm. not isolated or totem pole here. It is all on a level playing field. So, the same grace that is needed to come out of drug addiction the same grace that is needed to come out of um uh what was the uh, to, to come out of uh, you know alcoholism, alcoholism pornography or pornography or you know or anger materialism the same uh, grace that is needed for us to come out of that christ offers and um so in context you know when we're talking about the the woke church they have no biblical basis whatsoever to say that you know Paul just didn't understand yeah. what the Word of God was saying. And that's a perfect segue into the last point. And that is because of the fact that Paul, three times, the three uh, Pauline epistles, the reason that the woke church is at such odds with this is three times he makes a list of virtues and vices. And because he lumps everything underneath the umbrella of unrighteousness three times, 
in order to pull one thing out from underneath that umbrella and say that it's okay, it requires you to pull everything out from underneath that umbrella. So the work church, the woke church has completely modified mm. its stance on all sexual sin. Yep, everything. And, and so I have personally found, I can send you his Instagram if you're interested. Uh, really woke sad. pastor, he's got 20,000 followers. So sad. And there, I have a YouTube video, I, I shared it on Facebook, of this guy getting on camera talking about how it's okay to have premarital sexual relations. So because of the fact that they are trying so hard to justify homosexuality, they have to remove the umbrella from all unrighteousness. And that's how you can tell that it's wrong. Because it, you just can't. And, and so Paul's view of sexuality would, would have been very Jewish. Paul's view of how sexual things were supposed to happen would have been very Jewish, which was rooted in the uh, model that was given in Genesis, which right. is the model that Steve and I argue that you should use today. So our view is aligned with Paul's because Paul views, Paul's views came uh, from Genesis. That's right. right. And so this is the last point. Many woke advocates try to dismiss heteronormativity because they say it's an old-fashioned view and that it has no basis outside of Leviticus. Well, as we see... It's rooted in Genesis 1 through 3, and it stretches all the way to the New Testament. Right. So how did it stretch all the way from Genesis to 1 Corinthians? It stretched that far because the biblical model for marriage is the vehicle through which God chose mm. to make an allegorical demonstration of his love for us. Wow. Marriage is the embodiment of the single most important thing we have access to, mm. and that is God's love. It's actually very lazy to try to approach and condemn anything using Leviticus because we are now no longer living underneath Levitical law. So the Bible makes it very clear that marriage is so sacred to God that it, it doesn't take much digging to see that homosexuality must be condemned. Right. And just as homosexuality has to be condemned, there's a whole host of other things in the Bible that Paul is saying are unrighteous. So you can't isolate the one people group as being any worse than any other people group. Exactly. The only difference between us and the homosexual and the drunkard and the man who's hooked on porn is the blood of Christ. It's all. It's That's all. It. It's all the gospel. Every single bit of it. And you know the beautiful part of all of this is. As you know, Paul approaching all of these things puts it in context that none of these things will make it into the kingdom of God. It's a beautiful thing that you know Christ, in His love for us, um, comes to us not out of a spirit of condemnation, but a spirit of of love and grace. You know, and to know that regardless of where you are, you know, if you struggle with this particular sin. That um, the same grace that m makes liars, you know, s truthful. The same grace that makes wife abusers um, lovers of their wives. The same grace that, um, you know, we, are, we need to mortify the deeds of this flesh is afforded to, this, to that community as well. We, we have to come, Dalton, to a point where we either say, look, the word of God, it is truth. Or it's not at all. You know, it's we live in a generation that wants to pick and choose what they think is right and wrong. And we saw the end result of that. The book of Judges say, said, you know, uh, that and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And the nation crumbled and collapsed. Unless we have a moral framework in which to operate, um, our whole culture is in trouble. So if you're out there and you struggle with same-sex attraction... We, we have two final points. One, the blood of Christ is just as empowering for you as it is for anyone that struggles with any sin whatsoever. That's right. And that we did Absolutely. not do this to condemn you. Rather, we want you to understand why we feel that the woke church is wrong in, in trying to say that this is accepted. That's right. Biblically, this is how we have come to understand uh, homosexuality to be wrong. And so we're not condemning you. This is simply us trying to... Give an account Give you on behalf of the church that right. has really failed to explain. It failed. Completely and failed. And secondly, this last point as we wrap up. I was reading Matthew chapter 10. Jesus says to the Pharisees, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Mm. They then demand a sign because they, they want him to prove to them that he is the Messiah or the Savior. And Jesus basically says, you are an adulterous generation. And you know the fact that you demand a sign in order to know that I am Christ means that you have no faith. And that's something that Jesus would never stand for. And then out of nowhere, Jesus likens himself to the prophet Jonah. And so Jesus is here. He prophesies his death. And that was the divine sign number one. And then the, the second divine sign is when he likens himself to Jonah. The reason that he does that is because he says, you know, as Jonah spent three days in the belly of the well... Uh, you know, I will spend uh, three, days three days in the grave nice. and then I will come back resurrected. So his second divine sign, you know, not only that he predicted his death, but he knew that he would then be dead for three days and then come back resurrected. But 
here we see the, the key piece of Christianity and the love of Christ. Through Christ's death, we have been redeemed. And it was within those three days that Christ was in the ground as if you and I were alongside him three days in the belly of the well. Mm. And as Christ is resurrected from the dead and we are baptized and the old man goes into the belly of the well as you are regurgitated onto the beach like the prophet Jonah because we die with Christ. Through that process of baptism as the old man goes under the water as Christ went in the grave and you are regurgitated as the new man on the shore. The old man has been completely digested That's right. in the belly of the well. And so it is through grace that you can experience That's the so digestion awesome. of your unrighteousness. That's right. So here we offer you today not only our reasoning as, as to why we think that the woke church has messed up, but it's a path of repentance right. and the option and the ability to digest the old sinful nature in the belly of the well because Christ rose from the dead. It's, it's, it's an incredible hope to know that you, you don't have to make yourself right. It is the blood of Christ that purchased your redemption. You know, he, he, he did it. He did it for us. We just accept that grace and and live for him. Amen. We I just hope that you all enjoyed this. It was a little bit choppy trying to get through it. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's something that is so needed. And um, pray that this has helped you in some way, shape or form. Maybe you watch it this week. Maybe you might see this in a couple of years. I don't know. Um, but hopefully along the line, I pray that this has given you a, uh, a better understanding of what the Word of God actually says towards this one particular sin of homosexuality. Uh, we love you all. Appreciate you all. And uh, pray that you come to the, uh, uh, the wisdom and the knowledge of Christ as you live for Him. God we'll bless you. Week. See you next week. Whoop. Bro, that, that ended up being pretty good, I think. Oh, yeah, it did. Uh, Dalton, this is... Ridiculous.